heard about the Sepai mutiny, what the British call the Sepai mutiny. It was not at all a mutiny, mutiny meaning that the revolt of soldiers uh, against the British rule. It was a revolt of the whole of Northern India. All the population uh, really uh, revolted against the British rule. And uh, as what happened, it happened in, uh, in Lucknow, began in Lucknow, and Lucknow is the town of my father. So I've known about this story uh, directly. There was an old gentleman, very uh, distinguished and quite poor, who was coming to see my father in the 60s. And, uh, and he was talking about his great-grandmother. He was a great-grandson of Begum Azrat Maha. You know, it seems she was uh, fighting in the years 1857-1859. And in the 60s, her great-grandson was there and could, and could tell her story. So, uh, so I, uh, to tell you in summary more or less her story, uh, she was an orphan. Uh, from Lucknow. Lucknow being, that's why I call the title, I will explain you the title, in the city of gold and silver. Uh, it's not only because it was a very rich and very beautiful town, it was the capital of the richest state of all North India. But it is because, uh, in Luc not in Lucknow, but just uh, below Lucknow, in Awad, which was the state, the state of Awad was the richest of North India, it is a state, now you know about Agra. Agra was in that state at the time. Uh, in its heydays, uh, Awad, the city of Awad, the kingdom of Awad, was as big as France. <coughs> and uh, so it was very, very rich, but it was populated by Hindus and Muslims. And uh, these two rivers, Ganga River, which is the holy river of the Hindus, and Yamuna River, which was coming from the Muslim regions, were crossing in, in this state. And uh, it, it gave rise to and what was calling this uh, civilization or this culture, the Ganga Jamni culture, meaning the culture of gold and silver. Because people there, there was absolutely no uh, fight between these communities. It was, there was an op openness and, and communication between these religious communities, the Muslim going to the Hindu festival, the Hindu going to the Muslim ceremonies, and everybody really, there was never fights. It was really a very, very extraordinary um, state of affairs, and when one sees what's happening today, one really dreams of what it was at that time. And uh, this uh, cohabitation between these two cultures, Hindu and Muslim culture, gave rise to the most extraordinary achievement in architecture, in miniature painting, in music, in poetry. Poetry was very, very uh, important there. And all the best manners, the cuisine also, very beautiful cuisine. And as I said, the best manners, still today, if I say I am from Lucknow, people in India tell me, oh, you must be so polite. <laughs> you know, it's, it's very steady. So uh, Lucknow was really an extraordinary uh, culture. And I wanted to talk about this town. So to come back to the heroine, uh, this little orphan uh, who was brought up, she was brought up to become, she was Muslim, and she was brought up to become a courtesan. The courtesans of Lucknow were queens. They had nothing to do with prostitutes. They were real queens. They were brought up in a very severe way, uh, where they were um, they were uh, uh, taught uh, not only dancing, but uh, musical instrument, writing poetry, and uh, the best manners. Uh, so good that even the uh, aristocratic families were sending their son to get education in good manners among these courtesans. And uh, so she was brought up to become a courtesan, but she did not because she attracted the eye of the young um, crown prince was Wajid Ali Shah. And uh, she became, uh, she gave him a son and became his first wife. And he became the king. But uh, at the time, the, the British had annexed uh, the three quarters, at least the two thirds of India. 
little by little, by all sorts of uh, tricks, they find a way to annex. And, uh, but there was still this very rich state that they wanted to annex, and they could not find an excuse. Finally, without any excuse, they did annex it. And uh, it was a big scandal all over India. But, uh, and the people, the people of, of uh, Awad revolted, because the king was very much loved. I will give you also an example of how open and how he was. He was a Shia king uh, from a Shia, Shia religion and a Muslim religion. And he was, uh, because the family was coming from Persia, and, uh, but he was giving every year a, a sort of big drama for the people of his state. And the people were in the, in the garden, and he, uh, the drama was performed on the stage. And he was impersonating Krishna, the god, Hindu god Krishna. He was a Muslim Shia king, and he was playing acting Krishna, which is quite a, a, a thing. He was uh, with, you know, it was a blue god, so with turquoise powder, all his uh, body covered with turquoise powder. He was dancing Krishna. And he was loved by his people, as much as Hindus, as the, as the Muslims. So when he was exiled, deposed by the British and exiled, the, the population was very cross. And you know the English or the British always say, well, this mutiny came because these ignorant uh, Muslims and Hindus, uh, one told them that there was in the cartouche, in the, you know, to, in the gun you have these uh, bullets in your cartouche, and you had to open them with your mouth. And they were told that in the cartouche there were fat of pig and fat of cow. So for the Muslim, of course, they could not touch the fat of pig, and the Hindu could not touch the fat of the cow, which is a holy animal in Hindu religion. So uh, the story goes that the revolt of the Sipah, the mutiny, came from the fact that uh, these ignorant silly people uh, didn't believe and, and, want and revolt. No, the uh, revolt came from the fact that since quite a time, the Indian people were humiliated by the British. Uh, they were, the British were like masters in India. At the beginning, the British had been interested by the Indian civilization, but little by little, uh, they became very arrogant. And, uh, and, they were, and the Indians began to feel that they were no more in their, their homes, that they were no more in their country, and that they were becoming the slaves of the British. And the humiliation, uh, well, so when the king that they like, love was thrown out, then that was the end of it. And they uh, turned towards the uh, wife of the king who had stayed there and who had sons. And the youngest was Azrat Mahal, and who had a son of 10 years old, said, I am ready. I, I will, my son will be, I accept him to be crowned, and I will be the regent. And this woman who was brought up in, and kept in Perla, uh, uh, became, I mean, it was unbelievable because she won so that she became a fantastic state woman. She could, uh, she could manage the affairs of the state and she became also uh, a war leader. She was leading the battles against the British. The British tried to reconquer Lucknow. There was a siege of Lucknow, I won't tell to details, a lot of battles. And, and she was resisting and, and she was uh, fighting on horseback, or on an elephant back also. And it was, uh, and anyway, after two years, she kept the British at bay for two years. And nearly, nearly, and the rebellion went on all the north of India. She was not the only leader. She was one of the men, because Lucknow was the beginning, was the main center of the revolt. And she was the chief in Lucknow. But there were other leaders, of course, and the whole of North India was in flames against the British. But, of course, the, the weapons of the Indians were much, were much less, not so efficient. Um, uh, to give you an example, the rifle was shooting 200 meters, while the English 800 meters. So it was the same thing with the guns. So, and also, there was a lot of betrayal against, among the Rajas and, and the Nawab, because when they felt that the British may win, uh, they left the Begum and they sided with the British. So finally, she left Lucknow after one year. Lucknow was taken. 
she went and she began a war of guerrilla, guerrilla warfare, hit and run all the time on the horse with her soldiers against the British. And after one year, the army, her army was pushed towards the Nepal and, and uh, they were killed and in fever, etc. And, and she, uh, she uh, finally went to Nepal with her son where she was as a virtual prisoner. But she was, she lived enough to see the beginning, I mean the seeds that she has sown grow and the beginning of uh, um, revolts in Bengal in the 70s. And then uh, after that, of course, many years after Gandhi came. But since then, I mean, non-stop there were revolts. And with Gandhi, of course, it took another bigger. And in fact, Gandhi and Gina, and uh, in, in uh, 90 years after she began to fight, India was independent. So this story is, as you see, the story of an extraordinary woman. And this story has never been written before, which is unbelievable, amazing. Why it has not been written before? I suppose partly she was a woman, and the British could not stand the idea that she had been nearly beaten by a woman. That was one thing. Uh, also, she was a Muslim. And when, uh, after the, the this first war of independence, Indian call it not mutiny, but first war of independence. After that, the, um, the Muslims were really very hardly uh, suppressed. The Hindu were given much more possibilities. And also, they were more open. The Muslim felt that lost the power. And so they stayed very much aside. And, uh, and they have been uh, their land, the land of the, of the uh, Muslim uh, landlords who had signed as a begun, were taken, etc., etc., and given to the Hindus or all Muslims who had signed as a begun, who had signed the English. So uh, one was not want, did not want to talk about a Muslim hero, heroine. After that, when I suppose when India became uh, became uh, independent. Of course, it was a small minority which was Muslim. Um, and uh, there had been the partition with Pakistan. One did not like to talk too much about you know, all this and give too much uh, recognition uh, to people who had separated from India, uh, Muslims. So she was never talked about. And when I wrote, I wrote this book, and I tell you I wrote it. It, it, was, uh, it was quite difficult because there was very little about her. In fact, I went to all the libraries in, in, India, in, in England first. So there was about nothing about her. I mean, there was, yeah, there was a few things I tell you. It was the British Times of London at the time wrote in 1858. The beggar of Howard shows greater strategic sense and courage than all our generals put together. The Times, 1858. And, um, but apart from that, there are very little. In the uh, Indian uh, library in Delhi, I found very, very little. And so I went to Lucknow, and in Lucknow, of course, there was a lot. And not only uh, old manuscripts which were read to me, but also I went to see all the old families where, whose ancestors had fought alongside the, with the beggar. And they had, it was oral tradition, they were telling me all sorts of stories, I had to try to find what could be true, what could not, what was impossible. But anyway, and they had old manuscripts also, and it was most interesting. And um, there is one of the most important sources, however, was uh, six volumes, uh, which were volumes of the telegrams written between the British, you know, the civilian and military British during all this uh, fight. And it is during two, three years. You have every day telegram from all over India telling the army is coming there, they are advancing, we have won, we have lost, etc. The Begum has led a battle here, the Begum has a crown, had her son crowned, etc. So you, I got quite a few things from this telegram. It was a lot of work because it was all in total disorder, but it was very interesting. So it gives a precise. So I, this book was a. Uh, uh, cover, I'm very sorry, a 
it was a cover, it's not mine. I could not do anything about it. It may be okay, but it looks like to be a legend or a story for young children or I don't know. But it is a, it's, it's a serious historical book. It is a novel, it was for fiction, of course, but all the facts are absolutely you know, proven and researched. And the, the people also, I mean, the different people have been existing. I took just one liberty. Um, uh, the, this young woman, uh, she was 26 years old when she began the fight. Um, her husband had been exiled, but he was in Calcutta having a very gay life. I mean, he was exiled, he was, he was unhappy, but he had again a, a beautiful palace. The British gave him a lot of money, and he had other wives and dancers, etc. And she was fighting by herself in terrible circumstances from Lucknow. And she had a military chief, who was a young Hindu Raja, Raja Jela, good looking, I saw I saw statues of very courageous, etc. And I imagine I think it may have been true, I think it is true, but there is no proof that there is a romance between both of them. So there is, and this of course, nobody will ever know about that. So, um, um, so uh, apart from that, you will find in the book quite a lot of uh, uh, footnotes with quotations from British, quotations from Indian. There's, a, I, I have not written the page here, but I will tell you like this. Some very, it's very interesting because it echoes so much our world of t today. There is a, a quotation of the the governor, English governor, telling um, the, the main governor of India, telling we must fight these people. It is a fight of good against evil. I don't know if it reminds you something that was said by President Bush before the war of Iraq. Exactly the same word. It is a fight of good against evil. So, you know, I've been a journalist, so I, I'm very interested to see the correspondence between the epoch. So, um, uh, so that's how I wrote the book, I, I said. But why did I choose to write this book? So I've begun to tell you now. Uh, all my career as a journalist and then as a writer, I've tried to make, you know, there's so many, so much prejudice between different cultures, so much mis misunderstanding, so much ignorance. So uh, I try to uh, explain to my adoptive world, Western world, French mainly, uh, uh, what was my real world, the world from my ancestors, from my, from my uh, parents. Oriental world. And uh, of course, it's not easy, and I was trying to be a little stone in this huge bridge which is not built and which is less and less built, I must say. But I think I, I, I was so, to me also, it was something very personal to try to, to fight the prejudices because I am the result of a prejudice in the sense that when uh, my mother died, in Paris during the war. Uh, I was uh, one year old and I was taken by, um, by Catholic nuns. And uh, when after the war my father, who was uh, in India, asked for me, he sent two ladies to fetch me. Uh, the nuns hid me, sent me to the countryside, hid me. They did not want to give this lovely little girl to a nasty Muslim father. So he was, of course, nasty because he was Muslim. <laughs> and, well, he was, by the way, my father is, not, is a non-believer, but that's beyond the point. <laughs> and uh, so I don't say if it's good or bad. Uh, maybe it was better like that. I don't mean that. I just mean that my full life was totally changed by prejudice, religious prejudice. So I suppose because of that, I, I, was, uh, I was very prone to fight that. So, uh, I, in this book, um, uh, I, I chose to write this book also because it echoes the themes, themes which dominate the news today and which are a very great concern to all of us. One is the status of Muslim women. 
Uh, another is the so-called eternal antagonism.